This is the Dorset coast. It's one of the most beautiful coastlines in Britain. But it can also be one of the most deadly. Over the centuries, hundreds of ships have been wrecked here and thousands of lives lost. Gale force winds from the south and southwest would drive ships onto the rocks and shore or swamp them beneath mountainous waves. For sailors fighting for their lives, one place meant safety, a natural harbor known as Portland Roads. Sheltered from wind and sea by the long sweep of the Chesil Bank and the island of Portland itself, the waters here would always be calmer. And to make them calmer still, in 1842, work begins on two large breakwaters. Portland Roads was fast becoming one of the most important harbours of refuge on the south coast for both merchant ships and the Royal Navy. But there are other enemies besides the wind and the sea. For centuries, Britain's main defence had always been its navy. During the Napoleonic Wars, it was the British fleet that prevented France from invading and almost completely destroyed the French fleet at the Battle of Trafalgar. Now, it's 1852 and France has a new emperor, Napoleon III. He begins to build up the French fleet until it can match England's navy ship for ship. So once again, there are fears of invasion by France. But there is more worrying news to come. In 1859, the French launch a ship that will change the face of naval warfare, the battleship La Gloire. La Gloire has a major advantage over the ships of the Royal Navy. These are still made only of wood, but the hull of La Gloire is armor plated with sheets of iron making our cannons far less effective. And if our navy can't stop their ships, it can't stop an invasion. The answer, proposed by the British Prime Minister Lord Palmerston, was in a way to turn the entire country into a stronghold. Forts would be built to defend all the major ports and harbours along the south coast to be fitted with the latest and biggest guns of the day. These forts would destroy enemy ships while they were still out at sea, preventing them from attacking our ships in harbour or from getting close enough to land an invasion force. And for the defence of Portland, there would be the Nose. But a harbour as vital as Portland would need more than one fort to defend it. Enemy ships might attack from any direction, so what was needed was a network of defences to cover all the approaches. Between 1848 and 1872, three major fortifications are built. The Verne Citadel, the Noth Fort, and a fort at the end of the new breakwater. The Verne is a stupendous undertaking. It is literally carved out of the highest point of Portland itself by convict labourers and constructed from huge blocks of Portland stone. Once built, it is garrisoned by up to a thousand soldiers and artillerymen. On the west side, its huge guns cover the stretch of coast between Portland and the Chesil Bank. On the east side, it covers the main approaches to the harbour from the south. The Nose is built on the headland by the entrance to Weymouth Harbour, its guns sweeping the entire bay and the final approaches. And down at sea level, right at the harbour mouth itself, is the Breakwater Fort, which will carry seven massive guns. With so many formidable defences, 
any ships that dared to approach would be caught in a storm of cannon fire from almost every direction. The Nove itself is a brilliant example of Victorian engineering and construction. It is built as a huge semicircle on two levels behind a high sea wall. Set into the upper level are 12 gun positions called casemates. Beneath these, underground, are the magazines where the gunpowder and shells are stored. This semicircular design means it can fire in most directions from which enemy ships might attack. And its guns and magazines are protected by stone walls six meters thick. But however strong, a fort is useless without guns, and the Noth is fitted with the latest guns of its day. Like its two 64-pounders. These are muzzle loaders, just like all cannons up to this time. But inside the barrel, there is an important advance in gun technology. Spiral grooves called rifling. Lugs on the side of the shells fit into these grooves. Then, when fired, this rifling spins the shells at enormous speed, making them fly through the air with greater stability and better accuracy. Rifling also allows the use of longer, pointed shells which can travel further and hit harder than old-fashioned round cannonballs. So the Noth's guns can hit a target as far as three miles away. Firing great guns like these takes a lot of manpower and once the Noth is built it has a garrison of 150 men to fire the guns and defend the fort. These men literally live next to the guns themselves, ready for action at the first sign of a threat. Gunpowder is, of course, highly explosive, and if it were stored near to the guns, the slightest spark might set it off, blowing the entire fort sky high. So for safety, gunpowder and shells are stored well away from the guns in the underground magazines. Even here, there are strict precautions. The men who actually handle the explosive charges wear special clothing and cloth shoes, so there are no metal buckles, buttons or boot nails that might cause a spark. They pack the charges into protective leather cases which are passed through a small hatch into the main corridor from where the other artillerymen winch them up to the gun deck. Technology, of course, never stands still, especially where it comes to weapons of war. And in 1892, the Noth gets new guns, even bigger than its original 64-pounders. These are giant 38-ton, 12.5-inch guns, firing enormous shells nearly half the height of a man. Seven are installed, making the Noth even more formidable than it had been before. So only a very stupid or very brave enemy would attack a fort like the Noth from the sea. More likely, they would land a force on an undefended beach, then attack the Noth from the landward side. Fortunately, the Noth is also cleverly designed to defend against a land attack. The walls were built from solid Portland stone, pierced with loopholes from which the defenders could fire out. And to prevent really determined attackers from reaching the walls, 
a special defense is built called a caponnier. This sticks out from the rear side of the fort, allowing the defenders to fire along the main walls, sweeping it clear of attackers. Any soldiers trying to rush the walls would be caught in a terrible crossfire. But by the end of the 19th century, there is no longer fear of invasion by France. And in any case, the Noth's muzzle-loading guns are already obsolete. By 1912, the last of the great 12 and a half inch guns are scrapped, to be replaced by three six inch guns mounted on the fort's ramparts. These three guns alone provide more firepower than all of the Noth's previous cannons combined. Because they are breech loaders, they can be loaded and fired faster by fewer men with greater accuracy over even longer distances. And the shells they fire, instead of being just solid, explode when they hit. New centuries bring new enemies and new technologies. And when World War II begins, the Noth faces a challenge its original designers could never have imagined. Attack from the air. The Noth lies under the path of German bombers headed for Bristol. So, once again, its position makes it important. And it becomes home to batteries of anti-aircraft guns and their crews. On the fort's ramparts, a Bofors gun is mounted that can fire a hundred explosive shells per minute and hit aircraft up to a height of 20,000 feet. And the Noth's massive walls again make it the perfect place to store ammunition and it becomes one of the main depots for anti-aircraft shells for the southwest. And 3.7 inch anti-aircraft guns are also installed in what is now the fort's car park. The Noth Fort finally sees an invasion in 1944. The invasion of Europe on D-Day, as thousands upon thousands of British and American troops embark on ships from Weymouth to sail for France. An invasion that would lead to the final defeat of Nazi Germany. But the Noth's career wasn't quite over yet. During the days of the Cold War, when the threat of nuclear warfare between Russia and the West was at its height, the Noth's magazine level was converted to a nuclear shelter for civil administration. Heavy blast doors were installed to protect against an attack from nuclear bombs an attack which thankfully never came. It was the final episode in a remarkable history that had witnessed some of the most momentous changes in the technology of warfare, from muzzle-loading cannons to the atom bomb. <laughs>